Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to the Temerty Center Speaker Series with Dr. Devin Singh. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today as we hear from another excellent speaker, which uh, I will say a bit more about in a few moments. We wish to first acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The Temedy Centre for AI Research and Education and Medicine at the University of Toronto has been made possible by the generous donation of the Temerty family. TCARAM, as we like to call ourselves, is an interdepartmental center that serves as a focal point for collaboration among healthcare providers, trainees, researchers, computer scientists, engineer, and industry. And our goal is to transform health through AI. So just a quick mention, this event is CPD accredited. To obtain your CPD credit, please complete the evaluation form, and we will, which we will email to all attendees following the event. And please don't forget to provide your name and email address on the evaluation form to ensure you do get your credit. Also, just one housekeeping notes, we welcome your questions and thoughts. Uh, please use the Q&A function in Zoom to submit your questions, not the uh, chat function. So you can submit those questions at any point. And at the end of the talk, uh, I will pose them for Dr. Singh and he'll uh, address them during that period. The event is also live tweeted. Please follow along on Twitter using hashtag Temerty Talks. So without further ado, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Devin Singh. He is a practicing emergency medicine physician at SickKids. He completed his undergraduate studies at University of Western and afterwards attended medical school at the University of Sydney, Australia with his pediatric residency and emergency medicine subspecialty at SickKids Hospital. He uh, has also completed an additional fellowship in clinical AI at U of T and recently obtained his master's in computer science from the University of Toronto. So really uh, impressive background. Uh, we're really lucky to have Dr. Singh in our community. His research focuses on the applications of machine learning to solve some of healthcare's largest problems. He's the physician lead for clinical AI and machine learning at SickKids uh, for the Division of Emergency Medicine. And most recently, he founded Hero AI, an innovative startup lab dedicated to empowering patients and healthcare providers with AI. So without further ado, I will pass it over to you, Dr. Singh, and we're, we're very uh, pleased that you've uh, spent the time with us today. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. So thank you for the invite and thanks everyone for coming out to hear the talk and hopefully it'll be really informative and we can have a great discussion afterwards. And so what I wanna dive into today is um, this idea of clinical automation, particularly in the context of emergency medicine with this uh, concept of machine learning medical directives. Um, and I'm just gonna dive right in. Thank you for the great introduction. So I'll skip past that. And I wanna talk by, uh, start or start off my talk with my journey into clinical artificial intelligence. Cause I was not a technical person uh, you know, at the very um, sort of beginning of all of this, I was a pediatric resident um, working at SickKids Hospital. And there was a particular case when I was a junior resident that had a terrible outcome where a kiddo unfortunately died. And um, I remember being part of that resuscitation team and doing CPR and seeing this like amazing um, group of people come together to try and save, um, you know, this kiddo's life. Um, but unfortunately, we weren't able to do it. Um, and when incidents like this happen um, at a hospital like SickKids, it goes into like quite an in-depth review of sort of why did this happen? Um, what were some of the contributing factors? And, you know, being um, a junior resident as part of that uh, process was really eye-opening. I started to realize that you know, there were, you know, early intervention and health literacy aspects to things that, you know, we start to wonder, well, what if we, um, you know, had educated that family in a different way? And what if they knew to come a little bit earlier? Might this have contributed to a better outcome? But then you start to realize, actually, that many patients and families do seek out care across our communities, and they're really um, difficult logistical challenges, particularly networking hospitals together, bringing data together, uh, and there was like a whole logistical piece to how information is communicated about any individual patient um, that was a contributing factor. And then when you think about when someone actually arrives into your institution, there's a whole patient flow aspect. We need to get patients from point A 
need to be to see really effectively and efficiently? And, and how do we understand that when a patient arrives that they're the one who we really need to target our resources for and we need to bump up in the queue? And so there was a whole you know, field of patient flow and QI that I started to get into. And now imagine you know, being really early and trying to figure out your career and there's already these three big you know, pillars ahead of you, but then when you start to dive into any individual one, you realize that, well, of course the clinical care has to be outstanding at every step of the way and whatever solution you try to build that needs to be you know, founded on like just excellent clinical care. And when you do come up with the solution, it needs to be sustainable. Like it actually needs to integrate into workflows. It needs to be something that's sustainable, especially in a you know wonderful publicly funded system that we have um, with universal care in Canada, which you know I'm proud to be a part of, but all the more reason that the solutions we come up with need to be sustainable. I need to, for the most part, seamlessly integrate into workflows. And so this was a real challenge uh, for someone like me to wrap my head around. And I, I was literally at a wedding um, sort of talking about, you know, you know, where I was going with my career. And, and, and one of the guys that I met um, literally said, hey, dude, AI. <laughs> and he was a CEO and a founder of a really, um, you know, forward thinking AI company in the US, um, born in Canada. And um, he really opened my eyes to thinking about, well, actually, if we think about machine learning and AI, that we may be able to actually address many of these pillars with a common solution. And that's when I started to realize uh, that machine learning can help us connect the dots amongst many of those pillars. And that machine learning can really help us navigate this big data maze that is these EHRs now that are rolling out. And many of you will work in institutions that are rolling out EHRs. You know, I work at SickKids and we've had our EHR uh, for maybe at least like three to five years now. Um, and there's just so much data being generated and we need to make sense of it. And we need to you know, put it into a format where we can action on it. Machine learning can help with that. Uh, and I was actually, you know, accidentally surprised that machine learning can also help us transcend the traditional silos that our institutions are typically broken up into. You know, we have all of these different departments that work in this siloed nature, but ML really requires you to break down those silos and, and to bridge gaps. Um, and I was most sort of um, impressed by machine learning's ability to really focus on human care. And it sounds um, counterintuitive because it's all about the tech and the, the new algorithms and computational power and data. But at the heart of it all, like, why are we doing it? We're trying to improve the care that we deliver to our patients. And for me, that's these kids who come to sick kids. We want to empower our coworkers and our employees, whether they're surgeons, physicians, nurses, physician assistants, all of the administrators who make key decisions on how care is delivered in our institutions. We want machine learning to really empower these humans so they can do a better job at improving the way we deliver care across Canada. Um, and so this is, you know, throughout this journey, I realized this is so much about the technology being at a sense underpinning this all, it's about enabling humans to spend more time with each other, to enable humans to provide better care for the kids uh, who, who come to our institutions and, and for you, for your adult patients. And so with that spirit in mind, the idea of this concept of machine learning medical directives was born. And so let's dive into it. Take this very common situation that I see in the emergency department kiddo. He's got a fresh new pair of roller blades. Um, they're way faster than the old ones he had before. And it's great that he's got his helmet and all his gear on, but unfortunately, first time out on his roller blades, has a really hard fall on his arm. Goes home and he's complaining about pain. Um, and so his parents bring him in to the emergency department. Uh, and this is the typical flow through most emergency departments, and particularly ours at SickKids, where they undergo, our patients will undergo like a triage assessment. And at that time of triage, we capture a lot of important data about that patient encounter. You know, why have you come? What are your vital signs? What is your past history? Where are you coming from? Um, and there's really interesting data points that get plugged into our EHR. And I can tell you at this point, like time zero, essentially, this eight-year-old boy who's grabbing onto his wrist, complaining of pain, he already knows what needs to happen. He's worried that he's broken his arm. So, you know, if our eight-year-old boys figured it out, I'll tell you that, you know, the rest of our institution has probably figured this out as well. The nurse knows, the parent knows, and the doctor to see him here also knows that the clinical dilemma here is, is this 
patient, I'm suffering from a broken arm or a fracture. But unfortunately, during a really busy day, what will happen is that patient will sit into our waiting room, maybe for one to two hours, possibly longer if we're particularly busy. They'll get placed into uh, an actual assessment room and possibly wait another one to two hours. And by the time that they're getting to see one of our talented residents or a physician like myself, um, you know, possibly four hours or so has passed. But we knew right from the beginning this, this kiddo needed an x-ray and we have sort of wasted this time here of just having the patient sit and wait for one of us to be freed up. Now, what happens is I, you know, common sense, we definitely need an x-ray. I'm worried about a broken bone. Um, we get the x-ray done here. Uh, and then I need to free myself up to actually circle back to that patient, um, review the x-rays, and then begin to provision care and determine whether or not there actually is a broken bone and do we need a cast or do we need to call the orthopedics team? Is there possibly a surgical intervention that's needed? And for me to circle back, let's call that an hour or so, assuming that there's no big emergency happening in our department at the time, which will offer and delay things even longer. And so where are we at? We're getting to about four or five, maybe let's like six hours on a busy day by the time you go through this entire workflow. And we wanted to ask ourselves this, like, this question, if that eight-year-old boy way at the time of triage knew that he was concerned about a, a broken arm, could we actually teach a machine learning model to recognize that? And if we could do that really well, could the machine learning model automate the ordering of that x-ray to happen um, while that kiddo was waiting? So that by the time that I see the patient, I already have the x-ray done. And it, this is not rocket science. This is a concept called medical directives, which exist already where nurses uh, you know, have certain privileges to be able to order certain tests for patients, uh, much more common in the adult world, uh, less common in the pediatric world. And so we asked ourselves that question and then we had to step back because we wanted to make sure that we were solving the right problem. And what's really important before we get really excited and dive into building algorithms is we step back and we think about the sort of machine learning pipeline in healthcare. We want to know, are we actually solving the right problem here? Right. We want to make sure that we don't end up building an algorithm that works really well, but we find out doesn't actually integrate into a workflow and we can't actually translate. Because the whole point of this, if we go back to the beginning, was to not only just build an algorithm for the purpose of publishing and, um, you know, getting some praise and then moving on to the next sort of study. The real purpose here is we want to impact care. We want to get to the stage of clinical integration. And sometimes we're tempted to jump right into here. And this is where the computer science world, from my perspective, is really good, where we understand how to process data, we understand how to build models for that data. And for the most part, we understand how to validate models to feel confident that they're working. But without these key pieces, clinical use case design, user validation, thinking about the legalities of things and the ethics, we never get to clinical integration phase. We end up with lots of publications on really cool stuff, but it never reaches the patients um, at the bedside. And so we wanted to make sure with this project, we actually were setting ourselves up for success. And so that involves thinking about the project objectives. It involves um, clinical use case design, which you'll see in a moment is really rooted in design thinking methodology. And so when it comes to um, understanding our problem statement or performing a gap analysis, um, it, it's somewhat simple. We try to understand and quantify what is the current state uh, of our situation, of our environment, of our problem. The what, the when, the where, the who, and the how much, right? We do our best um, uh, you know, ability to quantify what's happening. And then we start to think about, well, what is the future state? Not what is the solution, but what is the future state to which we're trying to get to? And in our case, we wanted to be able to um, expedite the ordering of tests so that we could reduce the wait times and reduce the length of stay of patients in our emergency department. Because we know that longer wait times and longer lengths of stay leads to more adverse outcomes in emergency medicine. And so that was the future state we wanted to get to. But what it involved is then understanding where we're at, where we're trying to go, and then trying to brainstorm around the gap and how could we plug that gap up with solutions. From a design thinking perspective, when we talk about use case design, um, really design thinking is this awesome framework that we can leverage on that has a lot of principles that help to facilitate use case design uh, in a really in-depth way. In particular, the ideas around user centricity and empathy. 
and collaboration in order to really understand what is happening in the workflow. It requires talking to patients, in our case, talking to children, talking to the diagnostic imaging techs who do the x-rays, talking to orthopedics, talking to the physicians and the nurses and everyone involved in that workflow and collaborating to understand, well, what are the actual challenge points in a workflow and where could machine learning integrate into a workflow to drive efficiency and to drive improved care. And so, you know, design thinking provides this really great framework that allows you to work through that collaborative method, but then also start to pivot more towards ideation, experimentation, and in particular prototyping. And so you may, you might map out a workflow and then you map it, well, okay, let's assume we can build an algorithm that injects into this part of the workflow, well, what would actually happen? And you don't need to build the algorithm to know that, right? You could start to prototype and do walkthroughs of, well, if then this algorithm like actually happened here, what would happen in the workflow? And literally go into the environment, walk it through, sort of see what would happen to your flows, run simulations. And you could actually prove out ahead of time that if you succeed with your ML efforts, that your, work, your workflow will be improved and more efficient. And um, design thinking helps with that and sort of encourages that process. And it also helps you then think through what your AI blueprint will be. And this is something that I do with uh, for every project and with all of my students is I really challenge us to go through these design thinking methodologies for the purpose of filling out this blueprint. Because when you think about it, um, the input data that we use will highly influence where in the workflow our model can actually integrate into. If we use the entirety of a clinical note, well, the, the model might be able to deploy here. Right. But if we constrain ourselves to using uh, the triage note, well, then the model can deploy here. And so understanding where do we need the model to deploy in the workflow uh, is a multi stakeholder decision and engagement that informs how to think about building um, your AI blueprint and how are you going to solve this in a technical way. Uh, the target data, what are we actually going to get the model to predict? So we said we're going to use triage data and we want to. Uh, be able to predict the need for that downstream x-ray and then potentially automate the ordering of that x-ray right after triage, right? That's what we think will drive efficiency. But what does that mean, actually? Like, what are, what are we then predicting? Are we predicting when a, a physician orders an x-ray and, you know, using the very act of ordering an x-ray as the target label? Should we actually use all of the, um, the true positive cases as the predictive label? So maybe rather than the act of ordering an x-ray, we sort of leapfrog that and we predict who actually has a broken bone and is that what we're training the model to do? And you can see how making that decision requires lots of stakeholder engagement upfront. Um, and then we need to think through once we understand what, da what data we're using, it becomes an even more technical task around, well, what types of models um, are we going to utilize? And based on the machine learning model um, and the sort of the setup, uh, we have different outcome metrics that we'll use to validate our models. And, and you can see how a lot of this legwork gets done prior to any real um, code being written. And so what did we do? We went through this process. We took all of the triage data that was available because I wasn't sure where the signal would be. So I, if there was a data point at triage, uh, we extracted it from our, our EHR. Uh, we plugged them into three different types of machine learning models or uh, machine learning algorithms, something as simple as a logistic regression to things that are a little bit more sophisticated like random forest models and deep neural network models. And we did uh, you know, all three um, forms of modeling because again, we're not sure like how complicated is this problem from a prediction task perspective? And do we actually need neural network models or can we get away with something that's lighter weight and easier to deploy uh, like a logistic regression model? And we weren't sure. So we just, we used them all. And you'll see this is an AUROC plot, a plot um, showing the true positives against the false positives here uh, for our ability to use triage data to predict the downstream need of an x-ray. And so this is trying to predict what kids actually have a broken bone in their arm um, and then therefore needed that x-ray. And at first glance, this curve looks awesome. Right. Uh, and I remember, you know, I wrote the code for this and, and you know, managed the data. And I was just so thrilled when I saw that this was the output that we had um, achieved and was so excited. 
But then that excitement quickly wanes because remember, we're not just doing this to check a box for a publication. We're doing this to actually translate and drive meaningful impact for our patients, which then challenges you to think about, well, what do these outcome metrics mean on an individual patient to patient level, right? And when you start to think about, well, how many positive cases on this horse or on this vertical axis, can we capture? And what is the consequence of capturing them? You're very quickly humbled. Uh, for example, if I wanted to capture 100% of every kid that needed an x ray, I'm, my model is going to operate somewhere around here on the curve. And then if I dial it down, we're getting a 0.2, so like a 20% false positive rate. That's no good. I don't think clinicians, and more importantly, I don't think families are going to accept that for this, you know, few hours worth of efficiency gained, we're going to accidentally irradiate unnecessarily a 20% of our patients coming through the emergency department. Like, that's not going to work, right? And so you're very quickly humbled um, when you start thinking translation at every step of the way. Uh, and what we realized was we need to dial this way down um, and minimize the false positives which is essentially maximizing your precision or your positive predictive value. So we're minimizing the false positives. Um, but when we do that, we maybe can then automate the ordering for about 10% of kids. So is that helpful? Is that not? I could tell you we order this test very frequently. So it does end up to multiplying to many kids um, driving more efficient care. Um, but then what do we do with all the kids that we're missing, right? And so it creates then this this challenge where we go back to our stakeholders, we go back to that design thinking methodology and say, well, here's where we're at right now. How do we think about integrating into a workflow? But before that, we also realized that, well, if we could do it for x-rays, maybe we could actually automate small segments of testing for many different use cases, like ECG prediction, for example. You know, we can automate about 60% of those with low false positives. Maybe urinary testing. And you might think, well, why do you need to do that? But, you know, if any of you have kids um, or if any of you have tried to get a kid to pee into a cup, it's a whole song and dance and it takes a long time. Um, and often kids will wait just trying to get that pee into a cup for many hours. And so if we can automate that order right up front when a kiddo arrives, it actually drives meaningful efficiency. Uh, and so we can do stuff like that. You know, testicular ultrasound is um, a medical emergency and surgical emergency. Um, and so knowing that a kiddo might have testicular torsion or a twisting of the testicle and automating that order quickly really can drive a lot of surgical planning and downstream efficiency. We could also do it for things that are complex, like abdominal ultrasounds. Kids wait a long time for abdominal ultrasounds in any emergency department. And so even though this looks like a small fraction of the patients um, that we're able to capture in order to maintain a low false positive rate, um, look how low that rate is there. Um, it does drive meaningful improvements for those um, who, who can receive that clinical automation. And so back with our stakeholder engagement, we realized that we needed a dual prong or a two pronged pathway where kiddo comes in with his you know, possibly broken arm, data is put into our EHR like we discussed, but then we feed that data into a machine learning model right after triage. If the machine learning model fires positive, well, we know that we're constraining the model to have a very high precision. So very low false positive rate. So the chances if, we, if the model fires, that kiddo really needs that X-ray or needs that ECG or, or you know, um, ultrasound but we're gonna miss a lot of the positive cases. And so we're not gonna send those kids home. Those kids can go into the, the waiting room and undergo the typical standard of care pathway that currently exists um, across all emergency departments. And so in that sense, we're not missing any cases. We're able to mitigate the risk of all of the, the false negatives we're now getting because we're minimizing the false positives. But for all of the true positives we capture, even though it's you know 10%, 40%, 60%, um, we're still able to drive efficiency by driving those orders forward and getting those tests done prior to being seen by the healthcare provider. Um, and that time when someone like me sees the patient, I've got the clinical scenario, I've got my test results, and I could go straight to providing downstream care. And the hypothesis here is if we do this, these segments of automation for um, lots of different use cases, maybe even though someone is missed up here, maybe this pipeline or this part of the workflow will also become more efficient. And this is what we're trying to explore right now. 
We also recognize though that explainability is an important part of this, right? And I don't necessarily, I wrestle with explainability um, and I'm currently of the state of mind that explainability isn't necessarily um, relevant for model validation, that really a proper perspective trial, proper outcome metrics, um, you know, proper silent phase testing and clinical deployments are, are the way to validate models in a safe way. But I do think explainability is really important because I think people are gonna wanna know why a test is being ordered for them. And so there is a, uh, a methodology called SHAP values, which is game theory um, from you know, many years ago that's basically trying to look at who are all the players in a scenario and what players are contributing to the outcome of the game. Well, in this case, you know, the players are all of the different features that go into the model, all the different data points that go into the model. The outcome of the game is the prediction. Uh, and we're trying to understand you know, what features are having more importance in contributing to an outcome. And so here, this is for our deep neural network model. And you can see, thankfully, that um, when uh, you know, complaints of an upper extremity injury or a wrist injury, when that's present, so this red here means that that feature is present, you can see that the SHAP value ends up being high. And when the SHAP value is high, it's sort of pushing the model towards ordering the X-ray. Um, and so it's a little bit of a nice sanity check here. You'll see for things like when someone comes in with fever, well, most of the time kids with fever um, don't need an x-ray of their arm. Usually it's some sort of infectious process, um, like a viral infection of some kind. And so you see here kids with fever, you know, the shot value ends up being lower. And so we're kind of pulling the model away from ordering an x-ray. So this is nice on a model level, but if you think about what we do in practice, um, and when we walk through our prototypes through practice, really we go to a patient and we say, hey, I think your kiddo needs an x-ray or an ultrasound because of X, Y, Z. Therefore, we're ordering the x-ray, you know, do you sort of consent and agree to that? And there's this dynamic conversation. Well, if we're gonna truly move towards automated ordering of tests, we need to somehow sort of challenge ourselves to get close to being able to do that. And so with SHAP values, you can actually um, you know, generate feature importance on an individual patient by patient level. And by that, I mean prediction by prediction level. And so this is an example of um, our SHAP value plots for a few real patients um, in our emergency department with respect to ordering an ECG. So for like chest pain, heart problems, right? And you'll see here that the SHAP value is really high. Therefore, you know, the model is gonna order that ECG test. And what are the features contributing to ordering that test? Well, it's because the kiddo is having dyspnea or like a shortness of breath. Um, chest pain, and, and the nurse felt that the, the complaints were like of a cardiac in feature or sort of cardiac nature, right, from the triage. And so these were the main features that were pushing our model towards, yes, order an ECG. Um, also really important in medicine, though, is like, why are you not doing something? Because patients will often come in to an emergency department thinking they need you know, a certain set of tests done, um, but they actually don't. And so what is it about that patient's data that is, you know, having the model think, I don't actually need an ECG. And in this case, the only risk factor for this, um, you know, patient possibly needing an ECG was that they arrived <laughs> into the emergency department, but they were missing a lot of these key features. Um, you know, this is an example of like the patient had swelling. And so swelling usually doesn't go hand in hand. Um, at least in the pediatric population uh, with heart problems. And so the model you know, pushes away from ordering an ECG. And so is there a way that we could utilize these types of plots, but transform them into a manner that a patient can understand or where we can begin to automate that communication with the patient so that they not only see that our system is trying to order an ECG or an X-ray, but here are the reasons why. And when we sort of step back even further and, and look at, so where are we at on the journey now? Well, we've really gone through this phase right here. Uh, and I've broken this down because I get lots of questions on, well, how are you navigating REB and sort of governance at your institution? And we really think of it in these three distinct phases. Um, we, what we do is we generate these general sort of data access protocols that are um, exploratory. And so by that, I mean, you know, we have an REB 
that allows us to explore certain data sets. And so for me, it's everything that is generated in our emergency department. And rather than asking one specific hypothesis, um, with this data access protocol, we get to generate a whole array of machine learning models in, in a very effective, iterative way um, so that we can explore the data and explore the signals within our data. Um, and this is really powerful because we've been able to then start rapidly iterating um, through different algorithm solutions and different um, sort of predictive models without having to always go back to REB to get approval. So it's added a lot of efficiency. When we do have a model that we think is working well, and so many of the models that I showed you just now um, that are predicting ECG and X-ray and ultrasound and whatnot, um, these are now like model specific um, and use case specific algorithms that we think we can translate into practice. And so we start to pivot then into stage two which is really a silent period where we prospectively deploy these models and we're silently in the background looking to see how is the model performance holding up in an actual perspective pipeline. Um, and you know, we try to figure out statistically how many samples do we need in order to uh, sort of validate prospectively that the models are truly working um, in our clinical pipelines. And then from there, if everything goes well, we start to think about, well, do we need a clinical trial? And right up front, when we started getting success here, I realized that we had no capability of actually executing a clinical trial from um, the technical perspective. Because think about what we're doing. We're trying to like, legitimately automate the order of a test for a patient, which requires us to be able to have our model communicate with the patient directly. Patients need something in their hands. Healthcare providers need something in their hands. And when we recognized that there was gonna be a huge issue if we got to the clinical trial phase um, with an inability to deploy something into people's hands, uh, we realized that we needed, to, we needed to innovate. And so this is where Hero AI was born. I am the co-founder uh, and CEO. And so there is a conflict here, uh, technically, because I have financial gain from uh, this company. But really the company was born for the sole purpose of trying to actually give us an ability to translate machine learning models into people's hands. Uh, and what we realized was that it's hard for a researcher to get a grant to build an app from scratch. It's really expensive to do that. And because there's so many different algorithms we wanna test out and there's so many different use cases, um, getting uh, grants to build these apps from scratch is super high risk and it's actually quite inefficient. And so we had to be a little bit clever here and step away from our research project and think about, well, what do hospitals need in a manner that they're sort of willing to pay for? Like, where are the budget lines? What are the efficiencies where AI in healthcare actually has budget to improve uh, care delivery? Um, and that's in clinical care operations and that's in sort of hospital management. And, you know, institutions have budgets to pay for systems that enable that. And so that's what we chased after initially to build out this infrastructure so that we could pair sort of operational budgets and, and build solutions in that operational space that could also then create the foundation to deploy these experimental research models for clinical trial um, deployment. And so what we did was we built out three sets of software solutions, um, one around core AI dashboards, which uh, you know, our operational managers and our leaders need to understand sort of situational awareness in our emergency departments and across our institutions. Um, and then a core AI engine, which is really a backend architecture that can in real time ingest data from our EHRs and start to automate the pre-processing and the preparation of data for model ingestion and also serve data up, not only only to dashboards, um, but also to models so that we can get predictive um, sort of insights that feed into our dashboards. But then if you think about it, feeds into our ability to deploy um, these more research models um, in a prospective manner. And then we also built out the front end mobile applications to allow us to translate these solutions into the hands of patients and healthcare providers. So we're completing that link between data between sustainability, which is really on this end here, which is where the budgets are, and around um, you know, automating care and communicating care automation to patients and providers through our Beacon app. And so our provider facing app, you know, at a baseline, we'll, we'll give these situational awareness alerts around, you know, if your department is having high acuity or there's too many patients waiting and you need backup. And these are really like 
analytical things that drive efficiency forward that departments are looking for. Um, we also, from a patient perspective, uh, we'll be deploying this uh, throughout the summer in the Emerge at Sick Kids. We have an ability to detect certain states, right? And so when a patient is having pain, our algorithms can detect that and understand that and um, push out a, a front end um, sort of application interface to a patient to get them to fill out, you know, how much pain are you having? And then we let that provider know. But if you really step back and think about it and kind of the, um, I hate to say evil genius part about this, but from the research perspective, the evil genius part is that this framework here, uh, which can be sold and therefore be sustainable, right, is the framework we need to deploy these experimental research models into clinical practice. And so now what we can do is leverage these solutions and this technical foundation that we have sustainable funding for that we actually can deploy into the hands of the right people, but start to deploy the models that I've just described, where we take that triage data, it plugs into our machine learning medical directives. Um, if an x-ray um, needs to be ordered, we can communicate that to a patient. And with a positive test result, we can let our healthcare providers know. And so starting to drive this clinical automation use case forward and actually have the technical foundations to deploy it, which is really exciting. But there is a, a, a big sort of gap here, what we, need, what we need to figure out. Like, what is it that we should actually show to patients, right? It's one thing that the model with the high precision is saying, yeah, let's order the test. But what do we need to actually communicate to patients? This opens up a whole range of human computing uh, interactions research. It opens up some ethical questions, some legal questions as well. You know, what is the minimum information that we need to show a patient, even from like a medical legal perspective? Do we need to gain consent um, prior to using their data for this purpose? Um, and, you know, the manner in which we present this data to patients will also influence their, actually, their actual ability to provide that informed consent to get that x-ray done. This is something that is a massive area for great research potential. And um, I'm really excited at because now that we're deploying these solutions, we'll be able to start to unlock that type of translational research. Uh, it also involves, you know, um, again, wide sets of stakeholders. You need sort of user design experts, but you need a privacy expert. You need a legal expert. You need medical legal experts. Uh, you need an ethicist. You need your technical expertise and you need your patients and your clinician stakeholders coming together to understand well, what what exactly do we need to show you here in order to authentically and genuinely um, you know, communicate the needs for ordering a test? And so let's say we've solved all of that because uh, we, you know, in, in my lab, sort of we think many steps ahead uh, and we can see our path to this working um, really well. Uh, and so we're you know, planning for the next phase, the next problem. Uh, and really it's around, well, will we be able to deploy these models to other sites? Um, and if you think about it, we might not be able to. Um, and it's a lot of work to set up at one institution to then think, well, will you actually be able to do it somewhere else? And the answer might be no. And so we need to unpack why is that the case? Well, if we look, let's say this is Sick Kids Hospital here, um, our patient distribution, um, both around like ethnicity and age and the types of diagnoses and symptoms that come might be different from hospital two, might be different from hospital three. And we can't expect an algorithm that is learned with this distribution of data or this distribution with patient features to really easily be able to translate out to these other sites. And that's okay. This doesn't have to be a, a roadblock um, and sort of a deal breaker to pursuing these translational efforts, but planning for this upfront. And again, going back to that um, AI blueprint and the sort of design thinking methodologies, it allows you to identify these types of technical challenges early and start anticipating them and planning for them. And so, you know, common things that you see, well, we could pool data together. Um, from the different institutions and sort of test out our algorithms that way. And there's a lot of data governance barriers and, and privacy concerns and legalities there that need to be overcome, but I'll tell you they can be overcome. So institutions are looking to facilitate these types of relationships and I'm working with, um, you know, children's hospitals across Canada who are eager to do this, which is great, um, but there are a lot of headaches involved. Um, you know, another approach could be a federated learning approach that we'll explore. What would be really cool is we, we do this, but we also experiment with federated learning approaches and, and compare them to each other. And so what a federated learning approach is doing is actually, um, rather than taking the data out of every institution and pulling them together, 
we are training models at each of the different sites here and then taking the model weights and bringing the model weights forward. There's technically still some potential cyber security concerns with that, but certainly it's, it's far less concerning from a privacy and data perspective um, than all the data coming together. And so there's this concept of federated learning that we're going to explore with our different um, site partners as well. It's very exciting. But you know, even within your own institution, you can have a model that's working really well, but the environment drifts and things and the data set shift and a model that was working really well here might not work really well here. And I could probably, you know, not even might not, will not work really well here if you just kept that model frozen in time, right? And so how do we counteract environmental drift? And this is a huge thing um, that uh, we've been thinking through because every time the sort of pandemic related healthcare policies change, I noticed that the way that kids present to emerge and, and the volumes and the types of presentations that come completely changes. And our distribution in the past few years has been drastically shifting this way, that way. Um, and so, you know, building a single model and with the results that I presented to you there and we just fix it and then assume it's gonna work moving forward, it's not gonna happen. Um, our, our patients and the distributions are shifting dynamically now more than ever. And so we need to think about how do we counteract that environmental drift. And, and the, probably the most important thing is to recognize that it's happening. Like deploying a model and sort of set it and forget it and walk away uh, is going to potentially cause a lot of harm. Um, and so we need to think through machine learning ops frameworks and put in policies in our institutions that sort of regulate how we deploy a model, not only like when is a model good enough to be deployed, but how do we deploy it and, and how do we monitor um, model performance and how do we then like rapidly iterate when a model is drifting in its performance. And so it involves this part around, you know, monitoring and then when we detect there's an issue, we have a plan where we rapidly cycle through this chart to um, either retrain or you know, um, pivot the model in a way that allows its performance to be sustained. And it's really important um, that we put those infrastructures in place prior to prospective deployment of our models. Um, and so let's say that we get there and at SickKids, I'm really proud that we're getting there really quickly, which is, um, which is awesome. But the real vision for why I started Machine Learning Medical Directives was to be able to break down this barrier between our emergency department workflows and the home environment. Because think about if we could get physiologic data from reliable sensors um, in a home environment, and I think that wearables are only increasingly going to become more prevalent right, in our homes. And if we can get sort of triage data on why are you here? What is the situation? Which is what we're capturing here in the workflow anyways. If we could get that from the home, could we potentially take this algorithm and rather than use EHR data, we use uh, home data? And could patients who are deemed safe to do so go straight from home to a diagnostic imaging test potentially, and then to the emergency department if needed? Could we break down the barriers having solved all of the issues that I've discussed before to really rethink the way we deliver emergency and sort of acute care uh, to families across Canada. And we're very close to realizing this type of potential. But there are regulatory considerations because as we start to sort of break free from these sort of research clinical trial um, experiments and we're starting to um, go into people's homes um, and sort of break down these walls here, um, suddenly we start to think about, well, what are the regulatory considerations that we need to think through? And so there is a guidance document from Health Canada. Um, software as a medical device was um, sort of updated in 2019. And it, it helps give some understanding to what types of technology solutions and software solutions need to be regulated and obtain Health Canada approval and which ones don't. But here's the dilemma that I'm facing. Because of the pandemic and because of those environmental drifts uh, in our data, we, we probably need to rapidly retrain our models. And we're seeing this in our silent trials that we're running right now, is that some models need to be retrained uh, every month, like our ECG model, for example. COVID has created these like concerns of myocarditis and um, you know, we're ordering ECGs on, in children in ways that we never used to. And so we need to retrain that model more frequently. Um, 
The dilemma is that Health Canada doesn't yet have um, a process in place that allows for models to be sort of Health Canada Health Canada approved and distributed that require sort of online learning or frequent model retraining. And so realizing this uh, and hitting into that roadblock um, meant that we, then our team and myself in particular, needed to start partnering with people uh, like Ian Stedman, for example, who I saw as one of our participants, who is sort of is understanding the regulatory and privacy space and partnering with people um, like Health Canada and joining committees to sort of show that here are the use cases um, that we have. Um, and here's the reason why we need to rapidly retrain these models, because it's actually like a safety issue that without retraining our model performance um, degrades too quickly. Uh, and so joining these committees to try and change policy and inform the way that Health Canada looks at these AI types of models is really important. And as an anticipated roadblock that we're actively trying to tackle through great collaboration uh, with Health Canada. And they've been really, uh, really great thus far with really trying to think through how do we um, manage that type of space where there's adaptive ML that's rapidly going to need to iterate. There's also some, just as like a point of reference or some uh, frameworks here, this is really high level, but sort of goes over like what is good machine learning practice for medical device development. And it talks through many of the things that um, I've talked about in this presentation and a few other, few other things. So it's just a nice reference to make sure you're checking those boxes. And then from a privacy perspective, um, I was really humbled by the fact that you know, simply hitting our PHIPAA requirements might not actually be the best strategy. Uh, and in the industry space, it's all about like, have you met regulatory approval? Do you meet sort of the, the PHIPAA requirements? You do, you do, like, let's deploy it. Let's go out there and drive revenue, right? But when you start to add this layer of strategy, um, both in industry, but then this academic perspective, and you're collaborating with ethicists and um, legal experts um, and with patients and providers, you start to realize that we actually might need to raise the bar when it comes to um, the way that we check these boxes here. That maybe the, the simple baseline way in how we do this for the purpose of commercialization isn't good enough. Maybe we need to raise the bar a bit more on what it means to get informed consent. What does it mean to um, utilize patient's data? When do we you know, disclose issues? When do we delete patient data? Um, maybe this bar needs to be raised. And if you say, well, you know, that's kind of a, a waste of time, just hit the, the regulatory requirements and continue to search forward. Um, well, that might not be actually the best strategy because this privacy landscape is rapidly shifting. And so here, for example, Montreal has um, passed, or Quebec has passed the Montreal Privacy Law um, Bill 64, which is actually starting to raise the bar on a lot of these issues anyways. And we're seeing this happen in Europe as well, that you know, these ideas around simply de-identify um, and utilize anonymized information, there's starting to be a bit more regulatory oversight uh, on that. There's also these issues around um, potentially allowing individuals to have models and solutions forget their data, right? Like how will we, how will we solve for that from a technical perspective if we need to go back and forget people's data? And how is this going to be actually um, enforced? Uh, and I just present this out that when you're thinking translation, you ha we have to think about how these landscapes are shifting because we don't want to invest in building solutions that then very quickly get outdated, especially when it comes to regulatory and privacy perspectives. The other thing too that I find really interesting, um, just through my own personal experiences around enabling innovators, right? And if you really think about a lot of the stuff that I'm discussing is happening right here. And so if this is the number of publications that um, you, know, you can sort of generate um, from your projects, a lot of early ML research and algorithm proof of concept research um, happens here, right? It's early research, it's pretty low impact, but you can generate many publications in a year from that. But to get to the point of translation, to solve issues of regulation, of privacy, of ethics, of user interface and design, um, of like design thinking and stakeholder engagement, and especially when you're on that cutting edge or in the forefront of trying to bring about these types of changes, there are so many um, hours of meetings and in, you know, stakeholders that need to be engaged. And this is where the real work gets done, right in here. Um, and this is where there's no glory from an academic perspective but it's important work to be done. And so we need to think about us as um, academic institutions and sort of innovative institutions on how do we quantify 
the work that's done here so we can enable and reward our innovators to promote them forward, right? And to support them forward. Because simply investing in the large number of applications is gonna be sort of the, the wrong approach when it comes to if your organization is trying to translate and derive high patient impact here. And so this requires a bit of creative thought, like what does it mean to quantify the importance of someone's work as they push ML translation forward um, throughout the pipeline. And the institutions that um, you know sort of ignore this piece will get left behind in five years from their investments. And thankfully, SickKids has been really innovative in that approach. The last topic uh, that I want to bring about is this idea of bias um, and our bias assessments. And all of the models that I've described here, we conduct age and gender-based bias assessments. Uh, we identify models that have a really high error rate here. And, and then we think through why is that happening? We look at the data, we look at our modeling approaches, and we try to mitigate against that. And you would think that in Toronto, we have literally the most diverse population in the world. Uh, and Canada as an entire country, I think, has an incredible opportunity to build machine learning models that are highly equitable but we lack the ethnicity data to even know that our models are doing this. We lack the ethnicity data to be able to audit each of our models and perform these bias assessments in a real authentic way so that we can deploy these automated solutions and then say, yes, like the model works really well and it works whether you're white, you're Asian, you're black, et cetera, right? Regardless of your, your gender preference and how you identify with your gender identity, we need to perform all of these um, assessments and then be able to say that the models work well, but we can't. This is a massive roadblock to translation and something that we're trying to overcome. Access to hardware. Think about that use case where we're deploying these models to the home. If you can't afford, this is me like quick Google search, like how much does it cost to get a wearable? Um, you know, these costs here are, are quite significant, right? Even like the cheaper um, mobile phones um, are, are pretty expensive. And from a pediatric perspective, the solutions are even lower. So this one here gets you a heart rate and the oxygen saturation, which actually would be pretty important data signal from the home. It costs 400 bucks. Um, so if we build this solution and we deploy it uh, and the majority of patients don't have access to these types of technologies, we're actually accidentally um, widening the digital divide in our country. And it's the total opposite of what we're trying to do. Even access to basic things like internet. Um, I think internet as we, you know, as especially as AI starts to translate out into healthcare is really like a fundamental human necessity to be able to plug into internet. And if you look at our um, sort of national broadband internet service map, this is probably from uh, 2019 or 2020. So it's slightly outdated, but I'll tell you not much has changed um, that you've got these major pockets here where there's good internet activity um, and connectivity, but here there's these massive gaps. My dad recently moved right to here um, in between these two hubs. And he has like the worst internet. Um, and I'm just thinking like, we're building these solutions. We're going to translate them, but then people don't even have access to the internet they need to be able to connect and utilize them. Right. Again, we're worsening the digital divide. And what we don't want to do is build out these solutions and have patients sitting, waiting for their healthcare to load. Um, that, that's the exact opposite of what we want. Uh, and really, AI must be for everyone. And the translation of these solutions into clinical practice genuinely requires not only the academic work, but it, it requires advocacy around connectivity, advocacy around wearable accessibility, advocacy around you know, proper privacy law, and how do we translate these solutions in a way that genuinely respects and uplifts the values um, that we hold really proud um, from a Canadian healthcare perspective. Uh, and so with that, uh, I will end my chat and I look forward to any questions. And again, I really appreciate the opportunity to have come and talk to everyone today. Thank you, Dr. Singh. That was fantastic. Very interesting and stimulated a lot of thought and uh, questions. So I'm gonna, we have a few minutes. I'm gonna just take a, a couple questions. Again, use the Q&A function if you'd like to submit a question. Uh, to Dr. Singh, and then I'll start off with, and I have a whole bunch, but maybe <laughs> we can talk about some of those after, but let's take a first one from uh, the audience regarding the wrist x-ray prediction algorithm. How do false positives and negatives compare to pure clinical judgment? And maybe you can answer that question for that, but also just more generally, this is the question we're going to always get. Well, how is this better than clinical judgment? How do you even test that? Yeah, so it's what's really challenging about testing that is that often the negative result of a test 
is still equally important, especially in acute care and in emergency medicine care, right? And so one of the things we were doing though, is we looked at the positive predictive value of our clinicians in the emergency department and their ability to order tests with precision. And then we benchmarked the model against them. The model, because you can calibrate the model along that curve that I was showing, you could just set the model to really outperform the precision of our clinicians and have the model operate in that space. And so um, that was our approach that we did. But we're kind of a little bit humbled recognizing that it doesn't mean our model is genuinely outperforming our clinicians because there probably was a, like a good reason you'd think to order that x-ray because the negative result was also equally important. But given that this is a real you know, drastic shift in thinking that a, an algorithm would potentially have the medical legal authority to provision care to a kid, which is what we're, we're potentially saying here, right? With an algorithm automating the order of a test, we wanted to be really humble and play conservative, conservatively in that space. And so really maximize the precision, reduce the false positives and ensure that the models were outperforming our clinicians from that perspective. But it doesn't mean that that's the right way to deploy these models, but it's, it's definitely a, a safe first step manner to do so. Yeah, great. And um, there's another question. Does SickKids uh, ED have complete electronic charting? Is the EDIS tracking, physician notes, nursing labs all integrated in the same electronic system? And is that type of integration necessary to implement the type of AI tools that you're talking about? So SickKids does um, have a uh, a unified electronic health record system. Um, and so in the emergency department, all of the data, both the clinical notes, the vital signs, the orders, test results, everything comes back through that unified system. And so having a system like that is an advantage, but you'll find that um, many hospitals actually have like a combination of both where their documentation is written, but their triage um, uh, vital signs and physiologic parameters are electronic. And in that scenario, you can still utilize tools like this. Like most of the predictive um, features are rooted in like the chief complaint issue on why a patient has come, their age, uh, and the vital signs. Um, and so there's still opportunity to, to sort of integrate machine learning based solutions into those environments, but obviously um, an advantage to have a system that's fully electronic. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's another huge build and uh, amount of work that often hard to get grant funding for, hard to publish on. So I think it speaks to some of the challenges you were talking about at the end. Um, one more quick follow up on the first question. Have you looked at um, not just, you know, clinic, you know, physicians ordering, but have you looked at different roles in the hospital? So have you looked at, for example, triage nurse uh, ordering and how that compares to some of these? Yep. So one of the things we noticed um, was that, for example, that wrist x-ray example, we have a, a nursing medical directive where a nurse can order an x-ray. Um, what was really interesting, though, was when we get really busy, and then as the clinician, when it would have been so great to have had the patient come with the x-ray done, we find that the x-ray orders aren't done. And it's because the triage nurses, like, remember their, their initial priority is to triage. It's to very quickly identify what kid is unwell, what kid is not unwell. Uh, and their ability to enact medical directives, especially when you start to scale them to not just a handful, but if you're getting into the 50s to 100s of different tests that might get ordered in, an, in a medical directive type way, that framework starts to break down a little bit. Um, and it makes sense that it would because we need to get through um, all of the patients and triage them quickly. And so the advantage of medical directives um, in, a, in a machine learning space is that the busier you get, the more impactful that medical directive might be. Um, but interestingly enough, I'm collaborating with um, a group from MIT uh, and they're, they're writing some reports right now. And what they've done is they've simulated the impact of this concept of automated ordering machine learning medical directives at triage. And we started to realize that if uh, triage was the bottleneck, that the orders then would have less impact on the actual downstream efficiency than if you added like one or two triage nurses during a busy time, that the efficiency becomes statistically significant and quite drastic. Um, and so that's really interesting that like through our simulation work and our perspective work, we're recognizing that there is a interplay between algorithm and human resources that needs to be balanced. We can't just throw automation at everything because you start to then get other human-based bottlenecks that need to be addressed. Uh, and that's really fascinating work that um, hopefully will come out later in the year. 
Great. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. And it's again, a future or you, you've got me thinking a lot about the future. So it's a future oriented question. And it has to do again with these uh, integrated electronic EMRs. Do you think we have to simply rebuild these from the ground up? Uh, and in the future, they will be fully integrated with ML tools built in? Is that the future that you're envisioning? I don't think that the electronic healthcare record um, industry is going to solve ML for us in the, the genuine authentic way that needs to be done. Uh, and the reason why is that if you think about like an EHR, it needs to be built in a way that it could stamp across the thousands of hospitals across the world, right? Um, and this is why like when we get our EHR, it's not quite nuanced. Like we need this, we need that. Like it, our environment at any given hospital and emergency department has these like nuances to it um, that we need to then build in. And I think in particular, what you're gonna see is having the ability um, to customize your front ends, um, to customize your ML and for you to control the quality of your ML um, to, in a really intimate way, I think is gonna be essential because every population is gonna be slightly different. Every population is gonna need some sort of nuanced way that we translate ML that I don't think will be solved easily if you're an EHR provider, because really the EHR provider needs to think about like mass scale um, of how they build their record systems. But certainly there's lots of room for improvement in how EHRs are built. Um, and if there's like open bi-directional communication that might improve things. Um, and so, so yeah, that's sort of my take on that. Okay, great, great answer. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. There are a few more questions. I just want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Singh so much for giving us this fascinating talk. It was educational, but also got us thinking a lot and asking more questions and wanting to learn more, which is, uh, which is fantastic. So thank you so much for spending the time. We'll be watching closely as you continue your work in this area. If you love this talk and you want to watch it again, you can. The recording will be posted on, a, on the TKRM website, and please keep up to date with us on Twitter, follow, uh, follow us at UFT underscore TKARAM. And you can su subscribe to our mailing list and of course, visit our website. We're also on LinkedIn. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, have a wonderful day. Perfect. It was great to be here. And anyone who has questions, please feel comfortable emailing me. I'm happy to do one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, to dive into these things further. Fantastic. Bye, Thank you so much.